going back to where we started a little bit, uh, I guess with this stuff going on in China, I mean, in the United States, um, how close are we to having a pandemic? Is it inevitable that one of these things could eventually happen in the United States? And again, would, is it realistic that our food choices could actually prevent this, or they don't? They, you know, are they or they wouldn't be enough of a factor to prevent this. Well, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about: is predicting the next pandemic. And I've written articles for Slate and the New York Times, and in my book about how do we figure out what's coming for us and how do we protect ourselves. Um, one of the really interesting things is that if a virus or a pathogen is too deadly, it often wears itself out. So think about Ebola. It's one of those really scary things, but it kills people so quickly that it doesn't have a chance to spread beyond a few hundred or a few thousand people. What actually really worries us are viruses that will stay in you long enough for you to spread it to 100 people and then kill you. And so what we try to do is mapping out what kind of a pathogen, what kind of a superbug could actually do that. And the things that we have found is the most likely place that a pandemic is gonna come from, and a pandemic is different than an epidemic, pandemic meaning that it's everywhere. The ones that we're concerned about are called zoonoses, Z-O-O-N-O-S-E-S, -O -O -E meaning that they come, leap from animal to man. And then the question would be, well, where would this happen? And I've traveled all over the world looking for the places. And the group that I work with has identified that this often happens in places where animals are coming into contact with man in ways that they never have before. So things like deforestation or rapid population swelling, uh, places like Bangladesh or in China or in sub-Saharan Africa places where some child could wander into an area that has been uh, a deforested area, and there are now all of these animals without their natural habitat. And that's where bad things can happen. And then what we worry about is when somebody gets that infection, how is it gonna spread? And we get very worried when somebody with a deadly zoonotic infection gets on an airplane and that we can map the spread of all kinds of infections based on air travel. And that's one of the reasons, I'm on the ethics committee at my hospital and I think a lot about medical ethics and the ethics about uh, surrounding the idea that we're now quarantining 50 million people. Well, the reason that we're doing that in China is that we don't want people getting on airplanes. And that's a very tricky thing to, to address but that's how infection spreads. And then one of the other ways that we're looking at how things like influenza spread are just by Google searches. We know that when people start searching things about fever, flu season has hit. And so we're using advanced metrics and uh, artificial intelligence, all kinds of technologies to try to stay one step ahead of these things. Um, I'm not somebody who goes around trying to spread doomsday scenarios about these things, um, but the truth is that when we have animal and man coming into contact in novel ways, in ways that we had never seen before, and then people eating those foods that's, that are based off of those animals, um, that's when problems happen. Uh, and, and we're seeing that right now in the Wuhan province. Um, they're being very aggressive about the quarantining. Uh, the last I checked, we were close to 5,000 cases infected and more than, I think it was 107 people have died. Um, the question is, what is, have we seen anything like this before? And the comparison that people are making is to SARS. Uh, the, this is spreading more quickly. We don't know if it's gonna cause more deaths, but they're being far more aggressive this time in quarantining people. The question becomes, if something like that came to the United States, we have a handful of cases here, but would we quarantine our own citizens? How would that look? What would that look like? When I go into meetings now uh, in my department and when I travel to meetings, the scientific meetings, this is the thing we're talking about, is would we quarantine Long Island? How would we do that? And what would that mean for people? And how do we justify that when we're trying to put uh, the public safety as number one? Just to follow up on that, you mentioned deforestation. Um, so what, 
how does our food choices affect, you said the deforestation allowed animals to come into contact with people. So how do our food choices have anything to do with deforestation? Mm. So the animal agricultural system places an enormous burden on the earth and on the land because we're wasting so many calories by cycling them through livestock. When cattle graze, they're eating grass, and it takes a lot of land to sustainably support one cow. So in that instance, it's a lot of land involved. When they're eating grain or soy, or other livestock are eating grain or soy, then they're wasting a lot of those calories by cycling them through livestock, and that takes a lot of land per pound of flesh. So it takes about 12 pounds of corn or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef, takes about four or five per pound of pig and maybe three or four per pound of chicken. It's like a protein factory in reverse. And uh, according to a study published in Science last year, which you actually read an article about this on stage, and I've been quoting it ever since. It was published in The Guardian, an article about this study. Um, the, uh, it was a study of um, researchers looked at um, uh, over 119,000 farms in 120 countries, and they looked at 40 different food crops that represent about 90% of the calories eaten by humans. And what they ultimately concluded was that livestock are responsible for about 83% of all agricultural land use on Earth. 83% for 17% of the world's calories and 37% of the world's protein. And if just theoretically the whole world went vegan tomorrow, the amount of land we would free up would be equal to the land mass of the United States, India, China, the European Union, and Australia combined. That's how much land would instantly be freed up. So that could go to forests, that could go to wildlife habitat, that could go to solar panels, that could go to really awesomely sustainable organic farms, that could go to all kinds of different things that would become available and accessible to us at that point. So by taking all of this land and putting it into the livestock system one way or the other, whether we're directly putting animals there or we're producing food for animals there, we are putting a tax on our wildlife and ecosystems, which is fueling deforestation around the world and desertification around the world. And then on top of that, because we're doing it so unsustainably and we're eroding our topsoil uh, and using up our water, we're creating kind of a collision course for even more competition with the remaining little bit of natural world in order to feed humanity, unless we change how we feed humanity. And so that's, uh, I'm really glad you emphasized the positivity of this because, uh, I mean, it sounds really negative in a sense that like we're wasting so much land and we're just, mm -hmm. just causing so much destruction and of rainforest and so forth. But, you know, implicit in all of this is this enormously good news. It's not just twice as much land, we'd say we're three times, we're talking about, according to the National Academy of Sciences, 12 times as much land to feed someone eating uh, the standard Western diet as someone eating a plant-based diet. So uh, I think this is such a, a, a positive thing to, to really celebrate that we can, again, feed everyone on this planet a, a healthy plant-based diet on a fraction of the land and allow animals and, and ecosystems to, uh, to regenerate and our own health to regenerate and our society to come back into some kind of sanity again. Uh, and I think the question comes, I guess, really is do we have time? Because my feeling is traveling you know, ar around the world a lot lately, I'm giving lectures on this for the last maybe seven or eight years, um, seeing so many uh, vegan restaurants exploding. You know, it's just really great. We were, I mean, everywhere we go, we see this huge explosion uh, uh, and mushrooming of the vegan movement. It's going very, I love mushrooming because there's so many mushrooms in, in China when you're a vegan. <laughs> but anyway, you eat a lot of mushrooms. But the, uh, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is really growing so quickly. And I think personally, my feeling is, it's not scientific, but, I, but just in general, just seeing the way things are going, uh, the movement is, to me, so healthy and so uh, grassroots and decentralized uh, in the last few years 
that it's, I think it's really unstoppable. At this point, there's just, just the, the internet and just the, meat, the, the number of veg fests is just, again, exploding everywhere. We were in Athens, for example. Just in three years, they had a veg fest where it had 5,000 people, then the next year 10,000 people, and the next year 15,000 people. And we see this everywhere, you know, in Eastern Europe, in, in Asia, in Australia, all over the world, South America. Veg fests are growing, animal sanctuaries, uh, meetup groups, all kinds of things. So um, the question is, there's this like acceleration of awareness, of, of awakening, but there's also this acceleration of the destruction of ecosystems and whether we can pull it off in a sense, and whether we can save the world before we destroy ourselves and our sanity. And what, what is the, and I guess we don't know, but I think the most important thing from my point of view in all of this is to just give thanks that this earth is so beautiful and so abundant that we at least are, on, here, here we are, and there's, there's millions more people like us who are concerned and aware and are, are awakening that we can bind together with each other, we can encourage each other, and we can inspire and inform each other. We can find creative ways to work together. Each one of us has our unique perspective to bring to this. We each, one of us has our own unique talents and abilities and skills uh, that we can bring to this and just find a way to plug in and share this message in, in a way that works for you uh, and to just take a moment every morning to give thanks that we have an opportunity to do that to help uh, bring about a positive transformation on this earth and to help liberate humanity and animals and uh, and the whole web of life here because it is doable. I think we we can see it. It's, there's nothing stopping us. It's just fear. The, the fear and the inertia going along, uh, but we have something more powerful than that. We have love and kindness and creativity and caring, and we have the truth, really, on our side. And uh, as Gandhi said, satyagraha, truth power, speaking our truth, and understanding the issues, and then bringing our lives into alignment, and doing the best we can to embody what veganism is. And what is veganism? Essentially, it's love, right? It's love that's not just abstract, it's practical. And like, what are you eating? <laughs> what are you buying? How are we living? It's very concrete action. And when we embody that and take time to deepen our connection with the roots of our true nature, so that it's coming from a deeper level than just the cultural program, but we're actually coming from our own uh, infinite in internal wisdom, then I think each one of us becomes a radiating center of power that cannot be stopped. Each one of us, everyone who awakens to this is an un unstoppable power. And when we can light each other's candle, it it's unstoppable. We're creating a movement that is absolutely unstoppable because it's not based on us marketing this. We're not trying to market, we're trying to embody, I said, I'm not even trying, we are embodying, this is our true nature. And uh, I just see it, I see it's, it really is an unstoppable movement. The question is, uh, can we uh, do it in time before everything collapses in a sense in some way? And I guess time will tell, but it's a really uh, an amazing time to be alive and I'm grateful to all of you for uh, being born right now. Thank you. <laughs> hop onto that message of, of hope and optimism and the beautiful earth. Uh, because even though as we come from very different perspectives, uh, I just see so much overlap. And, and one of the things that comes up a lot for me is people sometimes ask me and they say, does it ever get you down, your job, just treating people with superbug infections? And the answer is no, uh, because the other part of my job, in addition to getting people better, is that I work with scientists who are constantly discovering new drugs to save people and to help people. And one of the messages I want to share with you today is where we're finding new antibiotics. And it turns out that the best place to look for new drugs is the soil beneath our feet. And what people may not appreciate, and which I didn't realize until I started doing research for my book, is that the soil is full of incredible diversity of life. And what's happening in the soil is that microbes, so fungi and bacteria and parasites, are constantly secreting chemicals, trying to engage in what we call subterranean warfare, where they're trying to win out by destroying what's around them. And if you can pluck out those chemicals that they're secreting, well, you've got antibiotics. That's what they're designed to do. They're ready-made. And the challenge we have is figuring out where to look and which drugs to invest in. 
because what we're finding is that there was a, I talked about this this afternoon, that there was this study done where they asked people to send in soil from Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And what they brought in, the soil had dozens of drugs. But typically, it costs a billion dollars to take that discovery and to go through all of the testing necessary for FDA approval. And so what I spend a lot of time doing is working with scientists and with computer scientists um, using artificial intelligence to try to find that proverbial needle in a haystack, the next life-saving drug. But what's so exciting about this is that it's actually in the soil beneath our feet. And so when we talk about preserving life and we talk about you know, deforestation and embracing our ecology, uh, we do have a beautiful planet, and we're finding that yet another way that the planet is surprising us is that it is full of all kinds of life-saving drugs, and we just have to figure out where to look.